In this video, I'm going to name the best player in every NBA franchise's history. As you'll soon find out, some franchises have a richer history than others, so it can lead to some wacky choices. Enjoy it, you sweet bastards. Atlanta Hawks, Bob Pettit. Casuals might argue for Dominique Wilkins thanks to his long highlight reel, but the only correct answer here is Bob Pettit, one of the earliest superstars in NBA history that gets forgotten about a lot nowadays. Pettit was a two-time NBA MVP and the best player on the franchise's only championship team in 1958, which is the only team to ever beat Bill Russell in an NBA Finals, although to be fair, Russell was injured in that series. If not for Russell's Celtics, Pettit Hawks might have won three or four rings. Also, did you see how fucking hairy he is? Jesus Christ. Somebody get him a goddamn razor. Boston Celtics, Larry Bird. Of course, there will be the ring counters who cry that Bill Russell should be in this spot, and maybe he does. But it's my list, and I think Russell is one of the most overrated players in NBA history, so Larry Bird gets the nod. Bird won three rings, three MVPs, two Finals MVPs, while owning a complete all-around game matched by very few throughout NBA history. Every year Bird was healthy in his prime, the Celtics were title contenders. While Bird's playoff career isn't as great as people remember, he still had many great playoff moments and was extremely exciting to watch play. If only he didn't shovel his mother's driveway and hurt his back. Shame. Brooklyn Nets, Jason Kidd. If you include the Nets' as ABA days, Julius Irving would most likely get the nod here, but guess what? I don't because the ABA was for pussies. Who doesn't love famous women respecter and unbelievably responsible driver Jason Kidd? He transformed the shitty Nets into a back-to-back -back conference champion in the early 2000s. Sure, the conference he did so in was historically awful, but Kidd was a maestro with his stellar all-around play. He was never a good or efficient scorer, but he did everything else at an exceptionally high level to make his team better. He was also the guy who was most known for triple doubles alongside Oscar Robertson before Russell Westbrook destroyed the stat. Charlotte Hornets, Kemba Walker. No disrespect to Kemba, but he's probably the weakest selection on the list simply due to the lack of competition in Charlotte franchise history. In a vacuum, Alonzo Mourning and Larry Johnson were both probably better players in their primes, but so only played three years for Charlotte and Johnson only five years. Kemba played eight years and made three all-star games in an all-NBA team. He is the franchise's all-time leader in win shares and points, and he would go on to rob the Boston Celtics of a lot of money. I respect the fuck out of that. Thank you, Kemba. Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan. He just narrowly beat out former teammate Scottie Pippen for the honor. Jordan already gets enough praise and worship from all his minions who pretend he's a demigod, so I won't go too overboard with praise. But yes, Jordan was really fucking good. He was so far above anybody else he played against in his prime, and he has the hardware to back it up. Six rings, six finals MVPs, five MVPs, ten scoring titles, the highest points per game in both regular and playoff history. The only way to really discredit him is to point out how his finals competition were a bunch of plumbers and community college students compared to some other all-time greats. But even so, it's hard to argue against Jordan being the best basketball player of all time. Such a class act, too. Cleveland Cavaliers, LeBron James. Just hearing the name LeBron James causes many people to turn their brains off and react with a vicious hatred. I don't understand it, and I've never really understood it. Nevertheless, this was a no dud choice, as Braun won two MVPs, a ring, and finals MVP with Cleveland, a franchise that hasn't won anything without him. If not for Kyrie's kneecap exploding in 2015 and Kevin Durant being a vagina and joining Golden State, LeBron might have brought multiple titles to the land. He's had most of his best postseason runs in a Cavs uniform, and the 2018 version of himself is still, in my mind, the best basketball player I've ever watched for a given year. I wouldn't be shocked if he decides to come home for a third time in the near future. Dallas Mavericks, Dirk Nowitzki. For a long time, it looked like Dirk would hold this title forever, but that was before Luka Doncic arrived. Still, for the time being, Dirk keeps this honor. He played 21 years for Dallas, scoring over 31,000 points, making 14 All-Star games, 12 All-NBA teams, 1 MVP in 2007, and, of course, Finals MVP and a championship in 2011. He was never an all-around player, but his unique skill set for a 7-footer made his teams really tough to stop offensively. There were many playoff disappointments before 2011 rolled around, and Dirk changed the entire narrative. I also love how he won the title in 2011, then basically did nothing but coast through the last eight years of his career. What a legend. Denver Nuggets, Nikola Jokic. This shouldn't be a controversial selection even though instinctually it might be to some people. Jokic is the only player in Nuggets franchise history to win MVP and he's probably going to do so again this year. As far as offensive players go, Jokic is about as complete as any other player in NBA history. He does everything well. He can shoot threes from mid-range, finish around the basket, and of course, tops it all off with his legendary passing ability. He's a treat to watch and I hope someday he's able to win a championship. Detroit Pistons, Isaiah Thomas. When it comes to Zeke, there seems to be a disconnect between how the people who watched him play feel about him and what the analytics say. People who watched him or played against him swear by him and say he's a top two or three point guard ever, while the analytics say he was a very good point guard for a few years before tapering off in his 30s. Regardless of where you fall on the Zeke scale, nobody can deny he's the best piston of all time. He led the bad boys to two rings and won a finals MVP in the process. He also most likely should have won a third title in 1988 as well, if not for a phantom call late in game six of the finals. Personally, I like Zeke because he pissed
pisses off Michael Jordan, and it's easy to see why, since Zeke's teams had a 3-1 record against MJ's Bulls in the playoffs. Thanks, Zeke. Golden State Warriors, Stephen Curry. I don't think Steph Curry is the best player in NBA history, but I could easily argue that no player impacts opposing defenses more than he does. Believe me, I know. I had to watch him play my favorite player in the finals four times. Let's not get it twisted, though. I still hate the Warriors and how they bragged about beating a badly injured Cavs team in 2015. I hate how they went twerking in the Hamptons to recruit Kevin Durant to create an unbeatable juggernaut. I hate everything about them, but I can't help but marvel at Steph's ability to take over games in a flash. He's always liable to explode for 20 to 25 points in a quarter in any moment. He's the backbone of the Warriors' rise to success over the last decade. Now all he needs to do is win a Finals MVP against a healthy Finals opponent without Kevin Durant on his team. Houston Rockets, Hakeem Olajuwon. Man Boobs Harden had a great run in Houston, but he still falls well short of the standard Hakeem set. Everybody knows Hakeem's hardware by now. He won two rings, two Finals MVPs, an MVP, and two Defensive Player of the Year awards. He also did it with an unmatched grace in the post that hasn't been seen from a big man before or since. He's also the all-time leader in block shots, although they only started keeping track of them after Wilt and Russell retired. Hakeem consistently raised his game in the playoffs in a way few players ever have, which is ironic since there was a point during the heart of his career where playoff success eluded Houston for some time. I always say this whenever talking about Hakeem. He was so good that nobody gives Houston shit for picking him over Michael Jordan. Yeah, he was legit. Indiana Pacers, Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller was a good, not great player who played forever to accumulate tons of counting stats. That's enough to be the best player in Pacers history, though. He never won a ring, but he was known for stepping up his play in the postseason and also had several memorable clutch shots late in playoff games. Reggie knew his role was to shoot and score, and he never strayed away from that. The guy played in 1,533 NBA games and had just 13 career double-doubles. All that rebounding and passing shit wasn't for him. He'd probably be even better if he played in today's NBA, to be honest. Los Angeles Clippers, Chris Paul. I almost went with the underrated 1975 MVP Bob McAdoo here, but in the end, I chose CP3 due to how he gave a terrible joke of a franchise real playoff expectations for the first time in decades. Sure, you can bring up how in his six seasons with the Clippers, they never made a conference finals, but again, CP3 raised the standard to the point where not making the conference finals was seen as a disappointment. If not for some fluky shooting from Josh Smith and Corey Brewer, LA would have made it there in 2015. But nonetheless, Lob City was a fun brand of basketball to watch, and CP3 was the orchestrator. His cliff call commercials were kind of ass, though. Los Angeles Lakers, Magic Johnson. Probably the toughest decision to make of any team, considering how many legendary players the Lakers have had. There are great arguments to be made for Kareem and Kobe, but in the end, I went with Magic because he's the best point guard of all time, and the Lakers were a guarantee to make the NBA Finals almost every year of his career, largely thanks to his brilliance running the offense. Magic was an elite player virtually from the very beginning of his career until the day he retired the first time. He's the best passer of all time, and he always churned out elite offenses. He was also a capable and ultra-efficient scorer when needed. He finished with five rings, three finals MVPs, and three MVPs. He could have accomplished even more had he been more open to using condoms. Never forget to wrap it up, fellas. Memphis Grizzlies, Mark Gasol. He started out as a throwaway piece in his brother's famous trade to the Lakers in 2008, but he eventually developed into one of the finest all-around centers in the NBA. He was never a huge scorer, although certainly not terrible, and he was never a great rebounder for his size, but he was an unreal passer and a terrific defender who led the most successful era of Memphis Grizzlies basketball to date. Although as a LeBron fan, I am obligated to point out that Mark's 2013 Defensive Player of the Year award belonged to LeBron. I swear I got nothing against Mark. I'm a huge fan of his manly, hairy chest and penguin dance he used to do. Respect the Big Burrito. Yes, that's a real nickname of his. Miami Heat, Dwayne Wade. I was torn on this choice since if you ask me who the true best player in Heat history is, it's LeBron James. But Wade was drafted by the team, developed into a superstar with the team, won a ring and finals MVP with them long before LeBron and Bosch showed up, then recruited LeBron and Bosch to win two more rings for the franchise. He holds a ton of team records and is the most famous player in franchise history. I loved watching Wade play, but he always came off as a little disingenuous to me. Milwaukee Bucks, Giannis Antetokounmpo. The choice came down to Giannis or Kareem, and I went with Giannis because he stuck around instead of leaving for the brighter lights. Imagine rooting for a player who changes teams in free agency. Ha, not me. Anyway, Giannis is why teams take flyers on raw, unproven foreign prospects every year, always hoping to find a diamond in the rough, and by God, did Milwaukee find one here. He kind of sucked his first few years, but then it started to click in year three. Then he developed into an all-star. Then, before he could blink, he became an MVP caliber player, winning two back-to-back. -back. The only thing missing for him was a ring, and after several playoff disappointments, Giannis won that coveted ring and finals MVP in 2021. Now, at just age 27, he already has an all-time great resume and is on pace to end up as a top 10 to 15 player ever barring injury. He can also probably give himself a reach around with his freakishly long arms. God damn, this guy's so lucky. Minnesota Timberwolves, Kevin Garnett. A pretty easy choice here. KG is far and away the best player the Timberwolves have ever had, and the only sort of playoff success they ever 
had happened with him leading the way. Now, to be fair, playoff success meant two playoff series wins in 13 and a half years, but KG was saddled with some dog shit rosters in his prime, so he kind of gets a pass. He was a fantastic all-around player who won an MVP and a shitload of other awards during his time in the Twin Cities. His only real flaw was that he probably should have been even more selfish as a scorer, but hey, nobody's perfect, right? Well, except me, of course, but you already knew that. New Orleans Pelicans, Chris Paul. It was basically a toss-up between CP3 and Anthony Davis, but I went with CP3 to make him the only player to be named the best ever for two different franchises. CP3 spent six years with the franchise and had two of the greatest seasons point guard has ever had in 2008 and 2009. In 2008, he came within one game of the conference finals, and that would be the only playoff series win the team had during his tenure before he demanded a trade. Regardless of how he left, he elevated the franchise to respectability during his tenure there, much like how he would later do with the Clippers. Man, I tell you, the CP3 guy is pretty good if you ask me. Injury prone, but still good. The New York Knicks, Patrick Ewing. Ewing beats out Walt Frazier and Willis Reed for the honor here, even though he famously never won a championship. It's tough to ignore how Ewing averaged at least 22 points a game, 10 rebounds a game, and two blocks per game for eight straight years in the 90s. He was the leader of some good but extremely overrated Knicks squads that stunk offensively but were elite defensively and always lost to MJ's Bulls. Ewing had a golden chance to win that elusive ring in 1994 when MJ retired, but in the finals he crapped his pants and ended up losing in seven games to Hakeem's Rockets. But enough of me being a negative Nancy. Ewing made 11 All-Star games, seven All-NBA teams, and one Rookie of the Year. The guy was really good. Well, until the playoffs. Sorry, I had to. Oklahoma City Thunder, Kevin Durant. Even though he is the basketball version of Judas to OKC fans, there's no denying KD is the best player the Sonics and Thunder have ever produced. Yeah, you can argue for Gary Payton, I guess, but get real. KD was a super duper star, and OKC enjoyed a tremendous run of success during his nine seasons with the club. He never won a ring, but he made an NBA Finals and four Conference Finals in a six-year span. He won an MVP award and four scoring titles. He was widely seen as the second best player in basketball behind LeBron for most of his time in OKC. No other player Seattle or OKC has ever had reached such heights. I honestly don't give a fuck that he left OKC, but man, why'd you have to go to Golden State? Jesus, it still makes me angry to this day. Orlando Magic, Dwight Howard. In a vacuum, Orlando Shaq was a better player than Orlando Dwight, but Shaq only lasted four years, whereas Dwight lasted eight. Both took a team to the NBA Finals while establishing their reputations as elite NBA players. Dwight won three Defensive Player of the Year awards in a row and finished as MVP runner-up in 2011 before things started to go sour in his relationship with the coaches in front office. Simply put, Dwight did more in an Orlando uniform than Shaq did. On another note, it's crazy to look back and see how close Orlando was to being up 3-1 in the 2009 Finals. Courtney Lee smoked a point-blank game-winning layup to end Game 2. They won Game 3. Then Dwight smoked two game-winning free throws late in Game 4 before a game-tying three by Derek Fisher. Imagine how different Dwight's legacy is right now if they had sealed the deal in that series. Philadelphia 76ers, Wilt Chamberlain. There are arguments to be had for Dr. J, Moses Malone, Allen Iverson, and Charles Barkley, but I ultimately went with the guy who did the sex with 20,000 different women, supposedly. Wilt only played three and a half seasons for the 76ers, but in that time span, he won three MVPs and a championship. He also led the league in assists one year for good measure. He dominated to such an intense degree I couldn't ignore it. It would have been even more of a no-brainer had Philly not choked away a 3-1 lead to Boston in the 1968 Eastern Conference Finals, but we all can't have nice things, I guess. I still find it hilarious that Wilt got tired of scoring so many points, so he willingly became an all-around player. What a fascinating individual he was. Phoenix Suns, Steve Nash. Oh god, just look at Nash. Isn't he such a hard worker? All joking aside, it's still tough to believe Nash ended up winning two MVPs. That's more than guys like Shaq, Kobe, Dirk, and Akeem. Even though Nash's Suns teams never made an NBA Finals, they came very close several times, making the Western Conference Finals three times. Nash played an exciting brand of basketball and was an absolute wizard. His offenses were always elite, and he truly did elevate what was a bad Suns team into contention almost overnight. That's why he gets the nod here, and only just recently had the Suns bounced back to success in the post-Nash era. Portland Trailblazers, Clyde Drexler. I came extremely close to choosing Damian Lillard, but I went with Drexler due to his teams having more postseason success. Their individual production is pretty similar, although Clyde led two Blazers teams to the NBA Finals and three Western Conference Finals appearances. Lillard has made just one Western Conference Finals during his time in Portland, not running from the grind, bro. If not for the Bad Boy Pistons and MJ's Bulls, Drexler would have brought a title to Portland. Another overlooked fact is how he never got to play with a prime Sabonis, who was stuck overseas. It would have made a dynamic duo for sure. But that's just another long list of what-ifs with the Blazer franchise along with guys like Bill Walton, Sam Bowie, Sabonis, Greg Oden, and Brandon Roy. So sad. Sacramento Kings, Oscar Robertson. If you're having a hard time remembering the Big O in a Kings jersey, that's because he played for the Cincinnati Royals, which is what the franchise was named at the time. Big O's statistical exploits are well known by now. He was averaging triple doubles before it was cool. He even won an MVP smack dab in the middle of Wilt and Russell's primes. He was an ultra-efficient scorer for a guard while putting
putting up all these huge numbers. I do find it interesting how his teams really didn't have as much success as you'd expect, and he'd definitely get roasted for losing as much as he did if he played in the social media era. But regardless, his all-around excellence should not be overlooked. San Antonio Spurs, Tim Duncan. I don't know how he managed to do it, but Tim Duncan somehow managed to maintain superstar status his entire career while skating by of any of the criticism superstar players usually get when they underperform or their team loses. I may sound like a hater, but I'm not. It's just truly fascinating to me. Of course, Tim Duncan didn't lose that often. He won five rings, three finals MVPs, two MVPs, and a host of other accolades. His teams won 50 games every year of his career except the 50 game season in 1999 when he won his first title. He was never an elite scorer, but he did so many other things well that it contributed to winning basketball. And it says a lot that his teams were always better with him on the court until the day he retired. Tim I! Sorry, had to do it once. Toronto Raptors, Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry was never as good as Kawhi Leonard, but Kawhi only stayed in Toronto one year. He wasn't as good as Vince Carter at his peak in 2001, but Vince declined and eventually left the franchise in shame. He probably wasn't as good as Pete Chris Bosch, but Bosch never won anything and left after seven years. Hell, it's arguable that he wasn't even as good as his former teammate DeMar DeRozan, but DeRozan left. Lowry gets the nod here thanks to his longevity. He stuck around for nine seasons, making six All-Star games, an All-NBA team, and most importantly, played a key role on the 2019 title team. When you add it all together, no player has a more complete resume than Lowry while wearing a Raptors uniform. Plus, he has a really thick ass. Wow. Utah Jazz, Karl Malone. Karl Malone is a massive piece of shit as a human being, and I feel guilty for praising him, but this is a basketball video, and the man is, unfortunately, one of the best basketball players of all time. His consistency and production in the regular season is quite honestly flat out remarkable and worthy of a top two or three player ever. But unfortunately for Carl, there's this thing called the playoff, and almost every single year of his career, he crapped his pants once he got there. His production stayed around the same, but his efficiency fell off of a cliff, and in the end, the mailman lost 18 playoff series with the Jazz. Think about that. For 18 straight years, this guy ate shit. Maybe there's still some hope left in the world after all. Washington Wizards, Elvin Hayes. Hayes is another great player that gets lost to time. He was overshadowed by other top big men like Wilt Russell and Kareem throughout his career, but he's going to get his due here. His best statistical years came early in his career with the Rockets, but with Washington, he was still a consistent 2012 guy with good defense. He helped Washington win its only title in franchise history in 1978 and another finals appearance the next year. He had a reputation as being a bit selfish and coming up small in big moments, but considering the other options the Washington franchise has to choose from, I feel he has the best combination of longevity, stats, and accolades. Hey, at least he never pulled a gun on a teammate or pooped in their shoe like another Washington star player did years later.